All right, thanks for joining everyone. Um, we are very happy to have you here. I'm Greer Ashberry. I work for the ACLU of Ohio as an organizing strategist in the Southwest Ohio region. And I'm gonna be acting as the moderator today. Um, we have folks from the Pretrial Justice Institute and from the Greene County Coalition for Compassionate Justice who will be sharing about their recent report release. Before we jump into the agenda, I just wanna cover a couple of uh, Zoom logistics. So we have recorded this meeting and we'll be able to share the recording afterwards. Um, it, you should, you're all muted right now. And when we get to the Q&A portion, you'll be able to raise your hand and we will unmute you to ask questions. You can also feel free to write questions in the chat anytime throughout the meeting and we'll be monitoring that. Um, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can during our Q&A portion. And we'll have a couple different points to do that throughout the meeting. Um, other than that, if you're, if you're not speaking or when you're done speaking and asking your question, we'd ask you to go ahead and mute so we can just minimize background noise today. Um, Laura, Curlis, and I will be monitoring the chat as well. So if you have any other issues during the meeting, feel free to put that in there and we'll try to help you out. Um, with that, we will go ahead and get started today. Um, a little context for our conversation. Right now in Ohio on any given day, there's 12,000 people who are sitting in jail who have not been convicted of a crime. And that wastes about $264 million per year for our state. Uh, we've lived through this extraordinary time in the pandemic that actually saw pretty dramatic decreases in pretrial incarceration as people like judges and prosecutors were working really hard to release people to prevent the spread of disease. Here in Greene County, the population got down to 135 people in the jail. But even as the pandemic continues, rates of incarceration have creeped up because systemic reforms are not in place. And in Greene County, the county commissioners are proposing a new levy to raise at least $53 million to build a new jail. So we're having this conversation today to delve into what's currently happening in the jail and the pretrial system and look at what information voters have available to decide if they want to support the levy or not. Um, several months ago, community members, members of the Greene County Coalition for Compassionate Justice contracted with the Pretrial Justice Institute to do a system assess assessment of the pretrial system here in Greene County. And so we are here today to hear the results of that report and hear the perspective of both PJI and community members. Um, so the folks you see on your screen are Megan Guevara from the Pretrial Justice Institute, Maggie Morrison from Yellow Springs, and then members of the Greene County Coalition for Compassionate Justice, Jill Becker, Lindy Keaton, Dorothy Bouquet, and Bomani Moyenda, who will be sharing their perspectives on the report. So we will just dive right into things. And um, our first question is for Bomani Moyenda um, with a little background on why was the report needed and how does it inform the jail levy vote? Hello everyone, I'm Bomani Moyenda. I'm a long time resident of Yellow Springs and uh, was with the original effort uh, to work against defeating the uh, tax levy a couple of years ago. Um, and despite of our success, you know, everyone involved, we did get the levy defeated. And we decided after that, to uh, reform and address some issues that we thought could help limit the jail population. Uh, we've reached out, several members reached out to members of the uh, criminal justice system, the system players, uh, trying to get data uh, so we could discuss what was going on with the jail. They would not provide us with that data, however. Uh, so we hope that they will work with the uh, PJI, the Pretrial Justice Institute, uh, and they refuse. So we continue to work with PJI 
to gather as much possible information about the current system. So this report informs us whether or not we should vote for the jail and we don't think people should vote for it. Well, Mani, uh, so let's hear a little bit more about what's in the report. So Megan, we'll turn it over to you to tell us about the main takeaways from the report. And then we'll turn it over to Dorothy, Jill, and Lindy to talk about their perspective on the main takeaway as community members. Thanks so much, Greer. And our report really asked more questions than it provided answers at this point. Um, voters are being asked to make a decision about jail funding really with insufficient information about the current jail population, the needs of the people who are in the jail, and what types of programming are or not available. Most of the data that we have comes from 2019. So obviously with all the changes that have happened as a result of COVID, there's a need for more up-to-date information. Uh, and this is really a very nuanced conversation, recognizing that the jail is in very poor condition currently and under a consent decree and changes need to be made. But because we don't know the extent of mental health and substance abuse issues among people in the jail, uh, we don't know the profile and the demographics of people who are coming into the jail. And we also know that um, compared to many other communities, Greene County is very safe and has a low level of violent crime. We really need that full picture to understand how the jail is being used right now and how decisions are being made in the courts in order for voters and citizens to make informed decisions and for the county to be able to plan for what's best in the long term. PJI is not taking a formal position on the levy, but the recommendation that we do make in the report is that there really needs to be a working group of citizens and county officials and people who have been impacted by the local criminal justice system to review recent data, to understand what is going on uh, in terms of jail trends, and then to be able to make decisions about interventions that will keep everybody safe. So we hope that those conversations will be ongoing and that there'll be more opportunity, as Bomani mentioned, for that data to come forth and for citizens to be able to understand uh, what's happening with their local system. And to add uh, to what Megan said, we don't have any recent data. We have only old data. And what we know from that old data, something that really struck me is two numbers. We know that about, or we estimate that about 80% of the people that were in jail in 2017 were suffering a substance abuse disorder or substance use disorder. And at the same time, we know that 82% of the people in jail at the same time in 2017 um, had been in jail or had had some encounters with the criminal justice before. So really the conclusion that I got from this is that we're recycling the same people over and over again, hoping that putting them in jail will give them an answer to their health needs. And it's not working. Not only it's not working, but it's expensive. It's expensive and ineffective. And so we are putting together this endeavors right now because we want to have better answers to our questions, but also better solutions on the table, a better solution than the levy that we have. Yes, and um, I was part of a group that interviewed and had conversations, community conversations with five different groups. And we encouraged people to tell stories about what they had experienced with their family and loved ones and what they wanted to see in our jail system. And the number one thing that everyone said was we need substance counseling, rehab, and mental health work. And um, that was not only in the jail, but in the community at large, that there was a lack of that. So um, it was a pretty straight, solid answer from every single group saying there need to be services that help people get on with their lives, not just locking people up. Um, I guess I'll jump in. Um, so something that I think uh, really struck me and I think it's just really important to point out is that we are not all impacted um, at the same rates. There's a dis, and this again, as Dorothy's saying is, is old data, but it's um, consistent with across our country. So, and, um, consistent with what at our best estimates today is there's a disproportionate rate of incarceration for black community members. 
um, 575 per 100,000 compared to white community members, which is 275 per 100,000. Um, so, you know, those uh, community members are disproportionately impacted because of systemic racism. And then we, I was also struck that the number of women held in our jail, about 30% is twice the national average. Um, and then given all that, just how unwilling, I think Bomani mentioned this, the county was to give us information to its, you know, to its own residents, even they were repeatedly invited into this process from the beginning through it. Um, just that they're willing to ask us for millions of dollars without a concrete plan or an updated study. Thank you all for, um, for kind of putting the, the cards on the table of kind of what we're looking at in the report. Um, and for if those of you who are listening have questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat because we're, we're opening up a lot of different topics here um, that I'm sure you'll have follow up on. Um, I wanted to take a moment to um, invite Maggie into the conversation to give the perspective of someone who has been intimately involved with the Greene County Jail specifically. Um, and so we understand that your son recently spent several months in the jail um, and invite you to share what that experience was like as a mother. Um, I'll give you the chance to unmute yourself. Thank you so much for this invitation to speak from my heart tonight. Um, I'm speaking as a mother and the main advocate for my son, who is 28. He's African American and Hispanic, and he suffers from mental health and substance use disorders. I read a statistic that states 40% of people with severe mental illness spend some of their lives in jail, prison, or community corrections. So many are incarcerated that jails and prisons are called the new asylums. My son has been incarcerated twice in the last three years. Both times he was arrested during a psychotic episode and he spent a total of 12 months in the Greene County Jail Eight of those months were pre-trial. My son was housed 24 hours a day in a cell. The only mental health input that he received was reactivating his medications. There was a lack of activity or mental stimulation. And I watched my son's mental, emotional and physical health deteriorate during his time there. I recently attended a meeting about the new jail proposal and I heard lots of information about the brick and mortar aspect of the jail. Most of the discussion that night was around the number of beds that this new facility should have. But there was almost no discussion about the people that live there and their basic needs being met in a new jail. Yet you know, these are some of our most vulnerable citizens sitting in a cell with no mental health treatment or services puts these citizens at even greater risk. So I'm here tonight to advocate for the vulnerable. A new facility will only be that. What happens inside a facility and the lives impacted by the implementation of real mental health care or services is where I feel that we should be putting our time and our tax dollars for better use. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie, for sharing that. Um, I really appreciate your vulnerability and willingness to share that story publicly. So we really appreciate you um, and are really sorry for what you and your son and your family have gone through. Um, I think you bring up a good point of um, what's happening outside of the physical building of the jail. Um, and so I wanted to ask Dorothy about what's going on in our broader context that is not addressed in the levy in the building plans for the jail. What else is, is part of the story? 
Thanks, Greer. So yes, I'm going to echo many points that Maggie just made very powerfully. Is that there is a disconnect between what the gel levy is offering and the reality of our community. Um, Green County is one of the safest county in the country. Uh, we have a low level of violent charges, and yet we have about 40% of the people in jail in Green County that are there before they have a hearing. So why are we detaining them if they're not violent? Um, the other aspect that is not covered in uh, the levy right now is that we have bipartisan legislation that is coming up in Ohio to reform our bail system. This, uh, specifically, we have two bills. We have HB 315 and SB 182. Those are bipartisan. They are supported by uh, the Supreme Court of Ohio. This could be a game changer in assessing actually how many beds we need uh, in the facility. But most importantly, what this levy does not include, it's any commitment in the budget of a county towards services that our inmates, that our that people in jail actually need. We have no commitments towards mental health services and specific, specifically we have no commitments uh, in the budget lines for uh, substance use disorder treatment. Um, so this is only a brick and mortar facility that would not get to the root causes of incarceration in Greene County. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, and, and I wanna ask Megan now, we've, we've kind of laid out, I guess, some of the, the holes or gaps that you all are seeing in the information that it's, that's available and the plans that are available. Um, Pretrial Justice Institute works all over the country looking at best practices for pretrial systems. And so we wanna ask you, what are more judicious ways that taxpayers' money could be used? How is it used in other places? Um, what else could be possible? Thanks, Greer. There are fortunately a lot of other options that Green County can explore. Um, we know that pretrial jail stays, even very short ones, can actually increase the likelihood that somebody will commit a new crime in the future. Uh, so using tax dollars for those jail stays can have negative implications far down the line for the community. So instead pursuing options that are available that are community-based, uh, starting from things like 911 alternatives, which a lot of communities are looking at now as a way to be able to help people who are in crisis related to mental health issues, um, lack of homes, substance use, uh, and as opposed to a criminal justice intervention, finding options for community-based diversion that put people in treatment programs uh, rather than putting them in jail to be able to address folks that have different types of needs. And then for folks who are in contact with the court system, things like support around transportation, child care, other issues that can help make sure that people get back to court, that they're still able to be held accountable for whatever they're arrested for. But while they're awaiting trial, they're able to remain in the community and they're able to get the help that they need to make sure that they can get back to court and the courts can function. And having those types of community-based interventions can offer longer-term support uh, for people who are dealing with longer-term issues rather than using the jail as a inappropriate intervention that can actually exacerbate issues and lead to that revolving door uh, that some folks have already talked about. And to understand what of those interventions are really appropriate to Greene County, we'll really take an examination of who's coming into contact with the system and the opportunity to sit down and have conversations. Uh, and I know that just in the past 24 hours and hearing about this event, uh, Judge Beth Capelli in the Fairborn Municipal Court has reached out wanting to talk more about the pretrial program that's happening there uh, and to be able to share some data about um, the people that are coming through the Fairborn Municipal Court we would love to be able to have those conversations across the courts in Greene County, uh, as well as with the Sheriff's Department and to really be able to, to dig in and to understand how can we match what the research says about most what's most effective with what the needs are of people in Greene County. Thank you, Megan. Um, it's, it's really interesting to think about what else could be possible. Um, I wanna pause now to uh, take time to answer any questions that come from the audience. So again, you can either write questions into the chat or use the raise hand function on your reactions button and then we will unmute you to ask your question. 
Um, and Laura, if you see any questions in the chat, feel free to pose them here to, to our group. And if there's no questions at the moment, then I will ask another question. Um, and feel free to, again, add your uh, question in the chat. Um, the, the report will be available in print form. We'll, we'll, we'll um, email you a PDF of the report after this meeting, and we'll be distributing it um, in other ways as well. So you'll all get a copy of that. Um, while we're waiting, if there's not more questions, I'm going to ask Jill to talk about uh, another portion of the report, which were community interviews. Um, so can you tell us about what you learned in talking to longtime residents of the county? Yes, um, we talked to about 10 different people and I focused especially on older African-American people who have lived here and grew up here and grew up during segregation. And then um, two of the women, desegregation started when they were in ninth grade. And um, each of them, as a, having growing up with that, it became a little bit normal. But they, all of the people we interviewed, had really spent their lives trying to counter the effects of racism in this county through education, through political action. And um, I'm going to read a little bit. Um, one educator who worked to close the achievement gap for low-income boys di discussed presenting a theoretical situation to groups of teenage boys. They were presented with a problem and asked, how would they handle it? Who would they call for help? And it's a situation where a white person would certainly have called police. Not one of them even thought of calling the police. And this was just an example of this kind of the deeply entrenched racism and the problems that come from that in terms of trust between law enforcement and a community. Um, another man discussed a legal case that he was a part of trying to desegregate the barber shop in Yellow Springs. Uh, the barber said he couldn't cut white, he couldn't cut black hair and they send in someone with curly hair and he cut it no problem. And um, they followed up with a racial discrimination case that went on for 10 years. And after all that time trying to establish case law to establish a precedent, it never even came to court because the barber retired. So there's this long history of racism that's been um, at the root of a lot of problems that have happened. <laughs> at, I don't know how to, to oversimplify it, but it hasn't gone away. It's tied with poverty, it's tied with educational possibilities. And all those would be such better uses for our money than just continuing to incarcerate people in ways that are not therapeutic, not helpful, don't improve their lives. Thank you, Jill. Um, and I, I encourage everyone to read that uh, community interview part of the report too, that adds much richer context um, to kind of some of the pretrial numbers and figures. Um, another question from Anne that I think would probably be for Megan is, has TCN been asked for their suggestions, which um, is a mental health provider in the county? They were not part of the interviews for our report, but we would love to be able to have them be part of further conversations um, because we did not get to the point of looking at what our potential interventions uh, would really love to have that be the next stage uh, and would love whatever they could share about what is working in Greene County and also uh, what gaps are existing. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, so this is an ongoing conversation and um, just because the report's released doesn't mean the work is over and, and more suggestions will definitely be uh, appreciated. All right, I have another question from the chat, um, which I'm going to summarize. Um, so 
Republicans have had a stranglehold on Greene County for 50 years or so. Um, there are 26,000 registered Republicans in Greene County, 13,000 Democrats, and 77,000 unregistered voters. Um, Republicans are not going to be amenable of the, to the idea of helping people in jail, um, no matter how much data you present. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to read the, the chat, it's small. Um, no matter how much data you present, that shows that helping people helps with recidivism rates, lowering crime overall, they are not going to want to spend money on people in jail. How do you propose to change that? Um, and I, I think that question would be for a member of the coalition. So whichever one of you wants to take that question, feel free. Yeah, Dorothy. I'll take it. And I'm sure that someone else can add to, to my answer. But in this case, it is, a, it, it, it is a wasteful use of our tax dollar, pay, tax dollar money. Uh, what we know is that jailing people uh, that have help needs is both ineffective and incredibly expensive. And actually treating is less expensive than that. So if we want to talk across the aisle to uh, Republican voters, what we need to talk about is the wastefulness of this, uh, of this levy. This is $53 million. This is more than one year of county services. This is an enormous budget, uh, even though uh, the, uh, the sheriff's office is trying to downplay it as being very affordable. It is a lot of money that could be used in so much better ways. The goal that we have is to make our communities healthy and safe for everyone. And by continuing the system that we have, we just recycle the same people for the jail. It is just a waste of our tax, taxpayers' dollars. Megan, maybe you can talk about um, how you've seen sort of partisan politics play out in other communities. Sure. In many communities, uh, the issue of pretrial reform specifically has been a bipartisan issue, partly for the reason that Dorothy just mentioned of how are we using government resources and where are there opportunities for cost savings? And also a, a big question, a big government question uh, that when we're talking about people who are pretrial, these are people who are innocent and, and are presumed innocent until proven guilty. And there's a lot of government interference uh, in individuals' lives that can come with pretrial supervision, that can come with jailing people pretrial. So this is an opportunity to really say, where does the government need to be involved and where does the government not need to be involved, as well as what is the most efficient use of resources, and of course, the question of safety. And it is a myth that incarcerating people extensively pretrial contributes to public safety because we know from research that in the long term, it actually increases the likelihood uh, that people will commit a future crime. So from the perspective of safety, of the efficient use of resources, and of trying to limit government involvement where government involvement doesn't need to be, there's, there's space in all of those areas um, for pretrial interventions, as well as on the progressive side of the aisle and looking at what are the opportunities for different types of interventions and support for people in the community. Um, and we'll feel free to continue putting questions into the chat. Um, we've got a couple more questions for the panelists before we open it up. Um, so we'll try to get to the rest of your questions as well. Um, Megan, I'm gonna ask this question of you again. Um, so, what, what do you, is the hope if the levy is defeated, what should happen after that? Um, if, it, if it isn't simply building a new building, what's the next step? Sure. And what I'm gonna mention is actually something that could start tomorrow uh, in addition to uh, after uh, the voters weigh in on the levy. But really this is an opportunity for a community conversation and for a bipartisan conversation uh, to be able to ask the question, what, are you trying to achieve with your local system in Greene County? Um, what are the outcomes that you would like to have um, when someone comes in contact with your criminal justice system? And then to be able to figure out what are the most effective interventions. Chances are that's not one thing. Um, building a bigger jail 
is not the answer, but there's also not just one other intervention that's necessarily the answer. Usually it's about finding several things, um, starting from what happens when people come into contact with law enforcement and what are the options that officers have to be able to deescalate someone in crisis, to be able to respond to a minor offense, as well as being able to respond to serious violent crime and those rare instances where it does happen in Greene County. And then what are the options that need to be available to the courts uh, to be able to respond when somebody has been accused of a crime uh, all the way through uh, when somebody goes to trial. Our report focuses mainly on pretrial phase because we are the pretrial justice institute, but there's also space to be able to look at once somebody has been convicted. Uh, we know that at least as of a couple of years ago, a lot of folks in the jail were pe people who were there on probation violations. So asking what are those violations? Um, are these circumstances that really do threaten the safety of people in Greene County? Or is it more related to technical violations uh, where people weren't able to be successful following the rules of the court? And if that's the case, what can we do to help support people and make them more successful? These are complicated, nuanced questions that really take some time and some thought. And we know that there are citizens in Greene County that are very invested in this. And we're sure that there are system actors as well who are invested in these questions. So this is really an opportunity to take some time and figure out what is a comprehensive plan and where does incarceration fit into that as well as where do um, several other options for interventions fit into that plan in the long run and how can we ultimately maximize safety as well as protecting the constitutional rights of people who come into contact with the criminal justice system. Thank you, Megan. And, and maybe a member of the coalition could answer that question from your perspective. Yeah, Lindy. Yeah, I, I just would like to add that I hope in our community conversation um, that in maybe a, a working group that's established that we could look at our juvenile justice uh, system I mean, throughout the state we've that system has reduced incarceration. Um, and just I know that we just opened in Greene County, a an assessment and intervention um, uh, center uh, for uh, the juvenile courts and um, I think that I, my, I suspect that we don't have the data that many of the people that are cycling through our jails maybe started probably not much younger, not much older than maybe, you know, that, that some of the um, people in the juvenile system, someone who's 18 um, coming into the jail, to the adult jail system probably has very similar needs. So I, I'm hoping that we could, as a community, um, look to, the, to that example and see what we could do better. Yeah, and, and I want to add to what Megan and Lady say that what I hope we'll, we'll get uh, from defeating the levy is that we'll get the county to disclose more data, to be more transparent about the users of our jail right now. I do hope that also we get the county to anticipate uh, the coming legislation on bail reform because this will change the game on how many beds and how big of a facility that we need. But above all, I hope that we'll get them to commit with dollars on the budget for more and better access to mental health services. So much. Um, and one another question in the chat on uh, sharing the report. I know we said we'd email it to everyone who's in he this meeting today. Um, are there any other plans to publicly share the report um, that you all wanna share? Yes, we are. <laughs> the question is really about how to do it uh, and, and very likely we'll post a link or uh, a PDF on our Facebook page, which is uh, the Green County Coalition for Compassionate Justice. If you type GCCCJ on Facebook, you'll find us and we'll post it there. And while we're on that topic, um, if people want to get involved with your group, how can they get involved or support you? I'll take that one too. Uh, so since we're in crunch time for the elections, because early voting started today, uh, we're at a time where we need funds to buy yard signs and to buy ads. And so if you want to help us, we need uh, two types of help. We need financial help. And I think Greer, maybe you can post the link uh, in the chat on how to donate money 
to our group. And also we need people ready to put a sign on their loan or to help us place signs in strategic places in Green County. Thank you. So I'd um, like to go ahead. Quick to weigh in on the uh, Republican stranglehold issue. I work with a community organization in uh, the East End of Xenia, the predominantly African-American part of Xenia. <clears throat> and uh, at the time, the word was like people were pretty uh, apathetic about what was going on and almost a sense of kind of like hopelessness, uh, like the uh, person who uh, relayed that question that they were just kind of like giving in, like these people are just going to do whatever they want to do just because they can. And <clears throat> once we began having discussions, you know, about how uh, white supremacy works, you know, to drain people of their spirit, you know, people kind of woke up and uh, got busy organizing and address some serious issues in their community. So I think a similar uh, effort like that needs to happen. Uh, we just need to you know, start reaching out and really having some deep community conversations and explaining this whole process. It was, you know, indicative like the, the way that uh, the uh, public hearings were handled, you know, almost immediately after the second one, where there were two required by law to put this issue on the ballot. Within minutes of the second hearing, you know, they put the issue on the ballot, you know, meaning that they had already had their minds made up in advance that they were going to do this. <clears throat> I saw a, I saw a statement on the commissioner's website where they mentioned, you know, they would be willing to discuss uh, providing services, but we've been asking them that for two years now and discussion versus having an actual plan, you know, it's really, again, I think indicative of their intent. They're, they're not gonna do anything, you know, if, if uh, this issue passes and they, uh, they build this shiny new warehouse. So we, I think we just need to, you know, really get out there and explain to people, you know, the nature of what's happening to them so some folks can wake up, help us get this levy defeated and uh, bring, you know, bring these people to the table. And I better stop right there. Thank you, Bomani. Um, I'm gonna pause to ask Laura if there's any other questions in the chat that we need to get to. Um, I'm not seeing any, Greer, but I didn't see the ones you had earlier. But I do want to recognize that uh, Judge Capelli has joined us, and we welcome her. And, uh, Your Honor, we have talked about the information and statistics you provided, and um, those will be disseminated. Um, and uh, the judge welcomes any questions to her about what Fairborn Municipal Court does and she's available to answer those. And Judge, I will unmute you here uh, since I have that power. Uh, okay. All right, here we go. If anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer what we do. We do have a pretrial services. I let Megan know that. We've had that for three years. We do have the model bond. We've had that for a year and a half. Um, and our stats, I think, are pretty good. Um, I don't know what Megan would say, but I, mean, I feel like we have a pretty good slice of a uh, small percentage that are still in custody. Um, I think the bonds have been working that we do establish for those who are under Amy's law. 
but it would have to be a violent offense or somebody who's had a warrant who would be in custody for us. There wouldn't be any nonviolent offenses unless there's been a warrant. Your Honor, if, if you don't mind, how do you think that we could expand uh, the bail system that you have to more courts around uh, across Green County? So there's been well, more bond reform and I think you may realize um, the Chief Justice in Ohio has done that. And so we did have criminal rule 46 uh, about a year ago. And then we had recently superintendents rule 5.02 so that requires that within a county, all municipal courts would have to agree on a bail bond. If you already have a model bond, such as I do, um, we're exempted from that. But that way, within the county, they would all have to have the same bond. And if they can't come to an agreement, it does have to be the model bond, which is presumed an, an own recognizance bond unless a violent offense. And I was actually on that group that uh, came up with that model bond. And so really, is it, so, so really my question is, how can we get it to more courts in Green County so that we don't have so many people that are in jail for nonviolent offenses uh, before their first hearing? The bail bond reform really goes more towards, I think, the municipal courts, which have a bond schedule. Um, and if you see the numbers for Green County that I provided Megan, in Green County, you don't have too many who are in pretrial detention who are misdemeanor. Um, it's about 38 percent is that right 38 percent of the people that are that were in jail i think in 2017 were there for non-violent charges um, before their first hearing not for misdemeanors i know okay um, so what would be what would be the number then well i can tell you i can tell you what i just sent to megan so just to give you an idea um, for a snapshot for today, out of 239 people in custody, there out of that number, only 36 were unsentenced misdemeanors. That's between two courts, both Zini and myself. So for Fairborn, we had um, 14. So I have 14 people in for that. Now, to give you a better idea, I have about 17, 18,000, 19,000 cases per year. So that's not going to be 36%. Yeah, but in that, that's for Fairborn. Um, the, the well, even other for Xenia, I can tell you Xenia's numbers are usually anywhere between nine to 12,000 per year. Okay. The other question that I add for you, Your Honor, is um, we know that we've diminished the, uh, the population in our jail during COVID, during the pandemic, it went down to 135 uh, people in jail at the lowest point. Did you see any impact in your court of that? Did you see any, um, uh, any decrease in violations uh, in your court? How did it look on your end? Meaning they didn't show up. We, so let me tell you what I did when the pandemic started. And that's when I started the model bond, which was an easy time to start it, quite frankly. Um, but I also had the rule that if I had a warrant for non-appearance, unless it was a violent offense or a probation violation, they were still to be released on an OR bond and to report in. There was a little bit of a turnaround on that. I'm people who had four or five warrants, quite frankly. So I'm not doing that anymore. I will tell you that. I am cognizant of when I'm sentencing somebody that I'm sending them to custody where they may have more exposure to COVID. So honestly, if anything, I could see my numbers going a little higher for sentencing. I have been very cognizant of that we're in a pandemic. But that's for, something yeah, that's something that has been on our mind, knowing that people go to jail and then come out and come back in our communities. It feels like it could really put more people at risk than what uh, uh, one can think about. Uh, but what we've noticed, too, is that there was not an increase in crime when we held less people in jail. And so, of course, that begs the question, why do we need to put so many people in jail? Well, I would say that you're going to have to look at a couple things for that. Um, one, again, not everybody's going to custody as much. Our numbers are pretty much the same, but 
I can also say they haven't been citing people as much, I think, in general. You know, if you look in Ohio, if you look at the numbers and you can look at the data dashboard on the Supreme Court's website, 2019 and before, and then you compare it to 2020 what the numbers were, there is a severe decrease in municipal courts. I can't speak on behalf of Common Pleas. I don't know their numbers. But I can say we also had the highest um, usage in, in America for drugs and overdoses. I mean, overdoses were out of this roof last year. Now that could be due to a lot of things, don't get me wrong. Um, it was obviously a hard year for many people. Thank you. Thanks, Judge Capelli, for being here and answering some questions. Um, I know I, we'll be really interested to talk with you further about what's working in your courtroom and, and what that means for the county. Um, what you just said relates to a question that someone asked in the chat about um, mental health services and uh, the criminal justice system. So the question is, um, for context, it's hard to get adequate mental health services, even for those who are not incarcerated, how do you propose those services be implemented? And should those be provided by the government as opposed to a community organization or business? Um, and I will leave that open to Megan or the community members, whoever wants to answer that question, feel free to um, jump in. It is a complicated question and something that so many communities are struggling with um, in terms of how to uh, provide access to those services. And so it is a question of um, what is available just as part of your uh, medical system that people may be able to access with health insurance. And, but for those without health insurance, what is your safety net going to look like in your community and what are services that might potentially be offered by government? So it's something that would need to be a explored a little bit more, but most communities don't have sufficient infrastructure for mental health and substance use services. And it's something that we tend to be hesitant to fund, whereas um, funding for uh, criminal justice interventions tends to get funded a little bit more easily. So this is an opportunity to, again to look at the big picture and say, where are your tax dollars going right now? And what is the county considering investing in and what's going to get you the best return on investment over the long term. But often what we see is that a mix of those services being offered publicly and privately is what's needed to really be able to expand the net uh, in your community. Uh, just a couple of comments. Um, um, I've been, uh, I'm Kate LeVacon and I'm a psychologist and I've been uh, thinking about this question and trying to gather a little more data for it. One difficulty about uh, getting mental health and substance abuse services uh, in uh, the jail is that currently if a person goes in the jail and they have say Medicaid, Medicaid won't cover uh, their services while they're incarcerated. So TCN, for example, cannot bill for its services if the services are provided in the jail. So I'm uh, also in my conversations with the um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Green County commissioners, uh, they do not seem to believe that it's within their set of responsibilities to provide treatment. So it seems to me that in terms of funding, it's a little bit of a hot potato. Uh, who's, who's willing to uh, step up and provide treatment uh, while, it's, while someone is in the jail? Um, there are some plans, uh, uh, although they are uh, not fleshed out in detail for the idea of providing treatment in lieu of jail, and this might be a, a, a something that could be worked out, that also has challenges as uh, here in Greene County, because of uh, funding challenges are, are previous, uh, as has happened in most places in the country, actually our previous uh, chemical dependency treatment at Green Memorial closed and our previous uh, mental health inpatient unit at Green Memorial closed. So th there are uh, significant financial challenges to providing that kind of treatment that are systemic uh, across our country. 
That doesn't mean that there are not places that have found uh, innovative solutions. For example, the Greene County Juvenile Court Diversion Center uh, has a, a set of services. TCN does supply some services. Uh, so I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying there's some real challenges to it. Okay, so I'm seeing oh. that um, Greer is having trouble <clears throat> mute, unmuting herself. So I can call on anyone else who wants to talk. I, I had a question, Kate, um, and this goes to the point that the money, oh, by the way, I've tried to help Greer, I cannot help her. <laughs> uh, but goes to the point about, uh, and I get levy language has to be very strict. So if it says it's for building construction, it's got to go for that. But they, you know, they could have asked for some operating funds. Um, but mm -hmm. okay, I've read what the response of the county was. And basically, they said what you said as well, Med, you know, Medicaid won't pay for anything. And, and they seem to uh, be convinced that the levy money that the taxpayers have voted for mental health services, like through TCN, et cetera, that, that that's not really available either. Is that, well, is that true? And then number two, I mean, is it your opinion that if we were to have more mental health and addiction interventions in lieu of uh, pretrial incarceration, that that would have to be a new source of funding? It's not my opinion. Um, so uh, for a little context, the Mental Health and Recovery Board gets different uh, funding streams. And one funding stream can be used for uh, things that cannot be billed to insurance like Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance. And funds like that do support uh, programs like a a mental health person in the jail or two or three or something like that. It is difficult because the community mental health center has many needy uh, 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 people, for example, housing for people who are severely mentally ill. Uh, but some of that fund is generally um, assigned to services in the jail. Services in lieu of jail can bill everything that we have uh, uh, out in the general public, Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance. So uh, a program in lieu of incarceration would be a lot more financially workable. Uh, or we need a change of heart regarding um, what a county uh, budget would like to uh, have in terms of its operating budget in the jail. Uh, and I've raised that point with Major Keller and I think uh, with Tom Kugler about if we reduce the population of the jail, these, we won't need as many corrections officers. Couldn't some of those people be people with mental health degrees? So uh, I think that might be a way that, that the county could think about it. Uh, and I think a treatment in lieu of jail might be a way that uh, uh, treatment could be afforded for people who currently go to jail. Well, I'm so glad you're working on this issue, Kate, and thank you everything you're you're doing and working with the county. Thank you. Sure. Greer, it I also think seems you... like <clears throat> it seems like we should be able to challenge the idea that Medicaid can't be used in jail. Like that that fact, that idea is so misguided. Certainly, I don't know if there are, Megan. I don't know if you know of people working on that because that's that's a serious mistake. So uh, I know <laughs> years ago I worked in a program through McKinley Hall that provided treatment services at the Clark County Jail. Uh, a guy I worked with went on to work at. Uh, prison in London and runs a treatment program there. So somehow, you know, these programs have been funded and maybe that's something uh, we need to look into. There's, so there are ways that it could happen. You know, you just have to have the uh, 
quote unquote political will to do it. Mm -hmm. I will say I'm uh, starting to collaborate with an old colleague of mine, uh, Tim Callahan, who's worked in the prisons, who's worked in the school system, and is very interested in seeing what we might be able to do in the jail. Uh, so he and I will continue to be uh, looking into that and sharing what we find. It looks like we're coming to the end of our hour. Do people have one last thought? Anything anybody would like to say before we close? I just wanted to respond, uh, Jill, to the um, question about Medicaid. Uh, sorry, it took me a second to unmute. Uh, and unfortunately, that is a federal limitation uh, in terms of being able to provide services while someone is incarcerated. Uh, and all the more reason to be able to try to provide these services in the community, as Kate mentioned, uh, that then there's the opportunity to be able to tap into um, Medicaid funding in a different way, uh, as well as to be more flexible in terms of meeting people's needs. Yeah, good. Thank you. Had a couple of reporters with us, and I'm wondering if they have questions. And and maybe it's a Zoom challenge that I haven't seen hands raised, or um, but maybe everybody wants to read the report and then uh, maybe send questions our way to the panelists. Okay, Chris Welter with Wiso doesn't have anything he put in the chat. Uh, yeah, definitely chat me up here, and if you do have a question or want to be unmuted. Okay. Well, not seeing anything else. So everybody on this Zoom call will receive a copy of the report. And Megan, can you say how they will get that? Rear has the contact information for everyone who has joined us tonight, uh, if you shared your email address. And so we will be emailing out the report uh, to everyone, uh, along with the two briefs that share highlights from the report. Great. And also, if that doesn't work, you can send an email to the green CCCJ, Jill, help me out which stands for Green County Compassionate Justice. Coalition. But if you look Coalition. on Facebook, you can just use the initials G, C, 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 J, Green County Coalition for sure. Compassionate, Compassionate Justice. Justice. And we will get that report to you. Okay. That's on Facebook. Mm -hmm. yeah, at, yeah, green, C, C, J at gmail.com. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And I hope uh, you read this important report, many, many hours of work by this group and by the Pretrial Justice Institute went into it. And we, were, we here in Greene County were so fortunate to be chosen to have their assistance because uh, it wasn't a given and it's somewhat a little bit competitive. So uh, we appreciate the Pretrial Justice Institute's help. Okay, um, uh, there will be a copy of the Zoom video available. Yes, London Bishop, uh, definitely. And can somebody say how that can get to London, a copy of the Zoom video? We've reached the limits of my technological experience. Greer will chat you up, London, and she will tell you how to do that. Okay, well, anybody else have anything? Last parting words? Okay, thanks everyone. Leave at your leisure. We'll leave the zoo, we'll leave the chat open. We'll monitor that for a little while longer. And, um, and thank you for being here tonight. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank, thank you everyone. Thanks a lot.